Hi everyone, and welcome to today's webinar about merging science and design to create new approaches to tree planting in the urban environment. Our speakers today are James Urban of Urban Trees and Soils, based out of Annapolis, and Adam Nicklin, a principal at Public Work in Toronto. Adam and Jim are both experienced designers working with trees and soils in the urban realm. Adam is a landscape architect and urban designer with over 15 years of experience in the UK, US, and Canada, and he's led numerous multidisciplinary teams in the execution of complex urban renewal and landscape projects. Prior to co-founding Public Work, Adam was principal at DTAH in Toronto. Jim, also a landscape architect, specializes in the design of trees and soils in urban spaces. He has been responsible for the introduction of many innovations, including most of the current standards relating to urban tree plantings. Jim was awarded the 2008 ASLA National Medal of Excellence for his contributions to the profession and is the author of Up by Roots, Healthy Soils and Trees in the Built Environment. Together, they'll discuss several projects in detail, including the collaborative process, technical, financial, and political, that drove different solutions. My name is Lita. I'm the creative director here at Deep Root. We are recording the webinar, and a link to that recorded version will be included in a follow-up email. Attendees will be muted throughout the presentation, but you can submit questions at any time using the chat box in the GoToMeeting control panel or on Twitter by using the hashtag RethinkTrees. We will have a uh, about 10 to 15 minute Q&A at the end of the presentation. So with that, we're going to begin. Okay. Thank you, Lena. All right. Jim, hang on one sec. We're going to be getting this over to you right now. OK. All right. So I I'm, I'm, should be on presentation screen here in a second. There we go. Is that, that up, Lita, correctly? Yep. Yep, we can see everything. That's perfect. Great. OK, well, uh, welcome, everybody. Um, um, it's always uh, good to be here and, and get to share uh, some of the things that I've been working on. And, and um, I particularly uh, like when I get to share um, this particular session with, with a good friend who's uh, knowledgeable about some other aspects of, of, the, of what we're doing. So I'm pleased that Adam Nicklin uh, will be joining us this morning. Adam, do uh, you have any opening yeah. comments? None but a bad word. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just as happy and uh, excited to share some of the stuff um, we've been doing with Jim. So yeah, hi guys. So today's topic um, is collaboration. Um, and the dictionary version uh, of that is uh, the simply the action of working with someone to produce or create something. But I think when we talk about design collaboration and our, uh, in, within our profession, we're talking about something else. Um, and I've always believed that the difference is that, uh, and I've written here, in a good collaboration, uh, the, the team brings skills to the table, but the process is open for each person to comment on the other's contribution. Um, and each person is open to changing their opinions um, and design in response to a new idea. And this critical idea that the result is something that neither person would have created on their own. Um, one little uh, aside here to the photos that we have here. Down in the lower left-hand side, um, you'll see two arrows is an orange arrow and a red arrow. And the red arrow, um, the orange arrow was the original design for the walk, that walkway that went around the building. And it was to run parallel with the face of the building. Uh, during a part of the soil conversation, um, I noticed that the building was actually not a series of circles, but was a series of ellipses of ever expanding radiuses. And so in the middle of the soil conversation, I suggested that maybe the walkway should be made on that elliptical um, uh, pattern so that it was um, uh, not parallel with the face of the building. Um, and everyone thought that was a good idea. Um, and that's what actually got built. So uh, when we're, we're talking about collaboration, everybody gets to comment 
um, and I think that's uh, on, on any part of, of, the, of, the, of other people's um, work. So we're going to be looking at uh, collaboration from a tree-based perspective um, and a design-based uh, perspective. And I will be representing the tree-based perspective, and Adam will be representing the design-based perspective in, in this conversation. Um, and so from the, the, when I look or consider a, a good tree and soil consultant, um, I, I believe that it is our job to mold the requirements of the tree into the design. Um, however, we don't want to compromise uh, the critical uh, tree components. Um, Adam? Yeah, um, it's funny the picture that we're using here. So Jim's put a picture up here of Massamoka, which is an art installation. Uh, at the entryway of Massanoka by uh, Natalie Jeremienko. And I, I can't speak for her, but I think this is probably as a provocation. And um, maybe the nature of a good collaboration is you both know what you're trying to do and you're working to a common goal. This is obviously not an attempt to grow a great tree, um, but it's an attempt to kind of poke, uh, poke a stick at nature and see what happens um, as a result. So it's, it's kind of a live experiment. So yeah, when we agree we're trying to grow great trees, then the collaboration um, maybe becomes uh, somewhat different. Yeah. So, so establishing the goals of of the, the what the project's trying to achieve is is pretty important to establish during the the, the setting up and the beginnings of the of the collaboration. Exactly, and I think your key point was it's something that neither one could achieve on their own. So it's not simply the execution of an idea. It's the formation of one collaboratively. So when, when I think about teams that I've been on, um, often the consultants uh, are sort of standing off to the side, uh, kind of in their silos. Um, and often everybody in, in the team is, is in a silo. Um, and we're receiving, the, the whoever's in charge of the team is, is receiving input um, and hopefully listening and hearing with humility. Um, but I, I came up with this idea, preparing for this, that the collaboration uh, was more like the barn. And so we all went into the barn um, to give our input, um, but we had to do that uh, in a respectful uh, but critical way. Um, and then for any of you who have been in collaborations, you, you, I'm sure you have seen occasionally that collaborations can be dangerous. Um, so we need to be worried about knocking over the silos um, or blowing up the barn um, in the process. Um, and avoiding that is as much about personalities and, and respect and humility as, as it is anything else um, on the, uh, as, as part of the dynamics. So. If we were to try to take that into a, a, a tree situation, um, on the left-hand side, um, we see that the silos, when you ask for their opinion, will give you solid standards and, and tell you, you know, how things should be done um, in, in their world. Um, but there isn't much give and take. Uh, where we're in, when we're in the barn, we sometimes can come out the other end with ideas that nobody thought of. So this particular example was a project that Raymond Jungle asked me to work on. Um, and uh, uh, he simply wanted to know what kind of soil he should put in this planter uh, to grow this tree. And everything was kind of set. Um, and I noticed that it was sitting over a large shaft uh, that we were able to configure. And we came out the other end with what, what I think will be the first vertical uh, tree pit. Uh, where we have a 14-foot deep um, uh, planting soil um, area that supports the tree um, and dramatically increases the soil volume. Um, how we manage to work that out and whether it will be successful, um, uh, we're still uh, ho hoping that we've got the right answer. Um, on, the, on the bottom of this slide, though, we, 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 we hope that we're all dealing with science. Um, but in our, we, we should understand that in the urban forest area, there's very little money uh, for, for science. Um, and I've unfortunately been seeing that science uh, can sometimes create myth. Um, and a good example of that is the rock-based structural soil uh, that I worked on uh, with Nina 
uh, Vasek and Jason um, back in the in the 90s, um, which we all thought was going to really work. But the reality is that as you go to sites, um, we find that that the, the treaties really are not performing um, the way that we would like them to perform. So there are, there are all different ways uh, which we can, can work. We, um, we probably spend more time than we should in the digital uh, environment. Um, I, I think Adam and I both believe that a face-to-face -face meeting, um, especially at the beginning of a, of a good collaboration for a complex project, is, is really important. Um, but there are other other ways of communicating um, that we're, we're all familiar with. Um, Adam? Yeah, yeah, I, I think the key thing is the relationship. Um, so all the ways that we have to work with each other are simply tools, and we have, frankly, tons more than we used to have. But I think building a relationship up front where the key collaborators on the project are able to exchange ideas fluidly and um, creatively is it's the real kind of opportunity we have for a project to stand apart. So I've, I, I can believe that that can happen in many ways, but honestly the first step for us is usually a face-to-face -face meeting. Now working again uh, through the process or you know maybe our relationship, Jim, you know, where we start to talk a short and we can shortcut that step sometimes, but um, it's usually the first kind of fundamental, fundamental point of departure on a good project. Mm -hmm. So when you're, if, if you're a designer and you're choosing a collaborative partner for trees and soils, um, there are a couple of, of things that you should be looking for. Um, uh, one is that tree experts and soil experts are not necessarily the same person. Um, sometimes they, they can be. Um, you need to understand on the tree side that um, somebody who's proficient in the natural forest sciences might not be very proficient in urban forest science. Um, and the, um, you need to understand that, that, that as you run through the different qualifications of arborist or certified arborist, uh, board certified arborist, that each of those kinds of credentials brings different experiences. Um, and Please don't forget that there are many landscape architects who have a tremendous passion for trees um, and make um, good collaborators. Uh, two people who come to mind are my friend Bernie Jacobs in, in Chicago, uh, who is a very good landscape architect in his own right, uh, but is a tr has a tremendous working knowledge of soils and trees. Um, and Paul Josie um, in Virginia, who uh, helped me write uh, uh, Up by Roots, um, you know, he is a practicing landscape architect, but makes a, a, an excellent uh, collaborator uh, for trees and soils. And similarly, the, when looking for someone to help you with soils, um, it's important to understand that a, a good agricultural soil scientist uh, may not have a good handle on urban soils. Uh, there's a, another whole side of the equation of geotechnic soil scientists um, who might not understand how to grow things, um, and you really need to find somebody who's got experience and, and knowledge in, on both sides of, of that equation. Um, and again, there are landscape architects who have a passion for soils um, who you, you may want to find uh, to put on your team. Um, so the, uh, you'll, you're going to be getting access to these images, so I'm not going to uh, bore you by reading through, through those. Um, but it's important to understand what it is that you're looking for um, in a consultant to collaborate with. Adam? Yeah, I think we're going to go to the next slide. Great. So we wanted to, maybe instead of just kind of plowing into the examples that we want to show you, which we will, um, we wanted to try and put them into perspective in terms of what we were just saying, the goals, what are we trying to do here, and maybe, maybe try and think back to why we try and plant trees and cities in any one particular way. And then the question that follows from that is, are we actually knowledgeable enough to do it alone, or do we need to collaborate? You're looking at a fantastic picture of Central Park in New York. So the next slide. Great. 
the first way that we typically started to do this was gross generalization, but in a part-like environment. So historically, um, let's say this was um, you know the English picturesque, an abstract of a natural landscape, idealized from trips abroad, Italy, and imported back to another country, but never a natural, um, never a natural system, but someone's idealization of what that should feel or look like. So we brought this to parks. We did it throughout the world. We did it in uh, we did it in Europe. We did it predominantly in North America. And it was actually kind of easy to do. And it was easy to do by default. It wasn't based on any uh, mass knowledge of uh, many people who implemented it had a, a bunch of knowledge and foresight in how they did it. But um, it lent itself to success. And the next slide. The next one we're gonna we talk about is that um, is the promenade of the alley. So here's an idea. I guess you know we can attribute predominantly to the French, but it was this notion that suddenly we move the boundaries of where the tree goes and the geometry of how that tree is executed. So you look at this picture, for instance. You know the distinction with the picturesque examples we just gave is that the tree or the base of the tree is now moved from the grass area to the predominant walking area, in this case, um, gravel. So if you change the slide now, please, Jim. So this then became the image of how we, we would expect a lot of public space to look, and historically how we expected the successful tree to look. And we still use this. Um, I don't want to say cliche, but this this enduring image in the design or planning of streets in North America. So you look at the actually the French Quarter in Shanghai, and you see this amazing image of, um, uh, of what happens when everything clicks into place. When you hit good remnant soils and the trees, in this case plane trees, form this luminous veil of green light and shade over a street. And in contemporary examples, um, the Charlottesville Mall, Virginia, um, the West A to DTH is um, promenade in the central waterfront in Toronto. We're showing examples of how this has done, been done actually pretty well, but we could have showed examples of where this has failed continuously over and over again because the planning vision is never matched by the execution. And this is because of the parameters have changed. We're now fighting for space in a street right of way, which typically every part of the organics has been removed. So we need new tools in order to plant new trees, uh, good trees. But we don't often do that. So next slide. No, um, but let me uh, make one comment here. You'll, yeah. you'll see that that the Shanghai example, uh, the trees are are widely spaced, and and there was good remnant soil. In Charlottesville, um, there was still good remnant soil, but the design really packed the trees very, very close together. Um, and even though Charlottesville is only a quarter of the, the age of the Shanghai example, um, the trees are, are now beginning to uh, fail um, because they are simply uh, planted too close together. Um, in the uh, Waterfront Toronto project, we were able to achieve the good soils um, and then moderated the, the, the spacing uh, as part of the collaborative process to um, get uh, spacing that works better with the, the species and size tree that we were um, talking about. Yeah, and I'd add that um, we're looking at a picture here at the East Bayfront where anyone who's familiar with it, because of the contamination of the former use of the land, fully one and a half meters of this district were excavated out so any environment for the tree as opposed to Shanghai where you know they just I guess looked on great remnant soil which um, which was already there here everything was bought in so this is all done with silver cells and I, I correct me if I'm wrong Jim this is probably hitting around about the mid 40s shared volume on each tree which are uh, maples yeah uh, leader I'm having trouble advancing this um, uh, picture uh, we have 
this same problem on a previous show at about this point in the show, and I'm not sure if it's something that's there, you're there clicking. Go. You're clicking forward, and it's not moving. I yeah, I, I see uh, the next one, no, but if no, any no, attendees okay. aren't seeing it, right. just let me know in the chat. Okay. Yeah. I, oh yeah, I have the next picture now. I have a next picture. Okay, so this this is uh, the next uh, typology we're going to talk very briefly about. We're going to talk about the Bosque. You look at a historic example, and really what we're saying here is, um, of course, it could be a regular Bosque or a grid of trees, but it's it's the environment when you're within or under the canopy of a tree. So you're immersed in a public space, and the roof of which is essentially tree canopy. Um, if you want to advance the slide, you were looking at the Place de Vaux again in Paris here, one of the best examples. And that's a hollow bosque. Um, what is ironic here, and Jim's going to talk to this example in a second, is that here we're actually removed from all those conditions that made the street so difficult to plant. We don't have to work around. Um, narrow right-of-ways, engineering requirements for servicing, excavation of all remnants, soil due to engineering um, design standards. Um, we really control a lot more of the variables, yet sometimes maybe here it's, it's our expectation of what this is going to look like on day one that becomes the limiting factor on our long-term Success. So, in in a way, we we almost get in our own. We get in our own way. Here is where design and expectation can get in the way of long term success. So, Jim, I'm going to pass this to you. And what what we are, are trying to show with the Bosque is that that, that the Bosque is essentially um, let us or, or is the tool that we use to put m way more trees in a space than we had in in the picturesque. If you can imagine that we've been compressing. The, the space and compressing the spacing and compressing lots of things so that not only is it harder to grow the tree here, um, but the design itself is now becoming a limiting factor to the tree. Um, and um, this, you can see on this as you look from um, left uh, to right, we start out with a, a, a really good tree, the middle row is a little weaker. Um, and the, the, the right-hand row is even weaker yet, smaller trunks um, as a result of that large building um, providing, um, putting those trees in shade almost all the time. Um, and so that's a function of the design um, and trying to force a, a symmetrical scheme into an asymmetrical uh, set of conditions. Um, and so hopefully the collaborative effort uh, can put those kinds of, of ideas on the table so that we understand what's what's likely to be happening. Um, so when we when we have bosques, for for example, um, we can overcome some of these problems through pruning. And the old pleached bosque um, was a good way of, of doing that. So every one of those trees is exactly the same because of the pleaching. Where below in at Bryant Park in New York. Um, uh, a very famous uh, New York City project, um, the center of the Bosque is beginning to die out uh, because of, of competition with light and, and space. Um, and another Bosque uh, in New York City at, at Hudson River Park, um, where you can see a dramatic uh, change in the size of the trees on the edge of the Bosque versus the size of the trees in, in, in the, the, the center. Uh, because of overly tight spacing and the design overriding um, uh, the biology of the tree that was selected. Adam? Um, am I waiting for that? Yeah, great. Okay. Um, it, it's too simplistic for us to just kind of lean on those first three forms and say that's how we've always planted trees, um, so that in urban conditions. Um, so that's how we always were. There are new ways. And what we're looking at here is whether there are ways that we can work around those, um, I guess, immovable um, kind of laws of psychology of a tree spacing, soil volume, and try and do it in a different way. Now, this is, I guess, getting into a realm of experimentation, and I guess by by definition, that means it's doing something that 
of course, we're confident that it can't completely not work, otherwise it's not an experiment. If, if it's something that is simply illogical, but it's also something then the experiment is how will it work and what can we expect over time. So this is a, a project um, by um, Van Volkenberg's office. Sorry, I was just still on the last slide for a second. And we're, we're going to get to, we, we have a, we are, we're going to talk about that in the next, after this, this sli oh, yeah. slide. Okay, there's go for a it. Chance. To, to tell that story. So the the idea of new forms that we, we don't want the biology to say that all these trees have to be planted exactly correctly or you might as well throw up your hands. There are all kinds of new forms that are possible out there from uh, this Philadelphia example where the old form might become the new form if we simply admit and understand what's happening. Um, and that's where the, the collaborator can tell you what is going to happen, and that may be fine. It may be fine that these trees have taken up the sidewalk and have no, no limbs on them for the first 40 feet. Um, or Peter Walker's uh, famous uh, trees um, in Chicago uh, growing out of the little uh, planted uh, uh, bubbles. Uh, or even this found tree that, that I've just fallen in love with. Uh, where a bird dropped a seed down the middle of this pipe coming out of the ground and a tree grew all the way up to the top. Um, is, is that an acceptable form uh, for the future? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but uh, collaboration certainly should be able to explore the, the outer levels of, of what is possible. Um, part of this problem is the um, that in the United States, we have a model of the perfect tree. This is uh, what, what we think every tree should look like, and it's not reasonable to think uh, that they, they won't all turn out that way. But we, we know that they, they don't. In the UK, for example, they have a different model, where they, they model for uh, crown longevity, where they cut the trees down uh, uh, from the top, uh, to in order to foster new growth at the bottom and create a, a tree that lives longer but doesn't look like the perfect tree. Um, so rethinking this model uh, may be really critically um, important. Um, so we're hoping that collaboration can, can successfully introduce all kinds of new ideas um, about planting. Um, and let's go back to this Michael von Bachlenberg project Adam, uh, which we have down at the bottom, you were sure. going to... Yeah, well, just very briefly, it, it's interested everyone in Toronto because we don't know how it's going to turn out and um, and what the long-term effect of it's going to be because it's it's modeling, um, I guess, a clonal tree, which, you know, the aspen starts from a single tree then sends up many from one living organism. It, it manages itself. We've never seen them planted together as individual trees this close, but we're actually genuine, genuinely intrigued to see how it works out and, and how we can manage that kind of form over time um, to get instant impact, but also have longevity. So it, it intrigues us. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know if you want to add more here. I'm just seeing yeah, the timing. I think the, the experiment here is not, you know, will all of these trees grow? And I'm pretty sure I can say that they they will not, and even in an aspen grove, uh, they don't all live. They, they, they gradually thin themselves out. So the experiment here, hopefully, that somebody has been told that as these trees die, that's okay. It's okay that 75% that, uh, of these stems over the next 25 years will all just disappear, um, and it'll be a different landscape. That's really the experimental question. Uh, for uh, this particular um, uh, design. Right. So we're going to move into how we did it. We're going to show you some case studies of, of collaborations that we both worked on. Um, and Adam's going to start with the project in Toronto. It's in Ontario. It's in Waterloo. So this is oh. Waterloo Park. I'm going to go quite quickly through the first two examples because uh, just I'm, I'm seeing the time we have. We want to have time for a ton of questions. But this is an example of maybe, you know, we were, we were talking about this as collaborative innovations from collaboration. Here was looking at what the park used to be. This is one of the oldest parks in, in Ontario, actually. So you're looking at historic photos on the top from 1890 and then below 
that's the first phase of work that we did, uh, which is now opened. Um, I'm going to show you the plan. If you flip to the next page, please do. Yeah. Um, here's a park which um, the plan you're looking at we actually did, and, and you can tell we're having a little fun there, but it's a historic park, yet we're executing um, or implementing the contemporary regeneration of part of it. And it was the notion that the innovation is no innovation. We take the tools which we had when this park was initially founded, shovels, soil in the ground, and labor, and we repeat that. So the budget for this was, I guess I'd say, modest um, for as far-reaching uh, kind of implementation of work that we did because we disentangled completely from the hard surfaces. And next slide, please, Jim. And I'll show you another project. Okay, so actually, sorry, one more on Waterloo. The next thing that we're working with Jim on is that um, the image at the top right now is a ball field, and um, it shows this as a four-sided bosk. We have two sides of it because forest has grown up to the edge of the existing ball fields. When those uses are moved, we're interested in then um, um, implementing the rest of that four-sided bus, so like a supersized version of plastic oak. The experiment then becomes how we can devise a soil system and maybe use time and grow these trees on in place to get maximum effect without, you can imagine the cost of doing that with any kind of technological advance, such as a structural system, would be staggering. And the next slide, please, Jim. There's a little delay. I'm show you an, yeah, so this, the next project, this is the Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design. We're working on this with um, Boston architect, NADA. And this was, uh, similarly, it had high tech and low tech, but predominantly low tech, you can see the diagrams on the right are um, the figure ground of the plan. This is an island that sits right in the middle of Toronto, so it's on axis with Spadina Avenue, um, a historic site, preservation historic building on the south, and a brand new um, addition onto the north, was that we separate out again um, all of the different components. So no tree sits in a hardscape, uh, except if you flip to the next slide, except this one. So can I, yeah, you know what, I forgot to put the circle on it, but if you look on the eastern side, there's a, a large tree on the plan which stands alone in the plaza. And then just to the right of that, you see the insignia of, um, of the University of Toronto. So this is a notion that we take the historic oak and we actually put it out of the context of the other 50 trees, and we put it into the context of the plaza. So here, in order to create 40 odd cubic meters of soil, we then start to lean on the high tech, the silver cell. So we take um, that. Oops picture of coke, we put it in the plaza, and I'm guessing that tree is going to cost as much as all the others combined. And that's under construction now. Next slide again. You know, the one thing about, about this particular project um, is that uh, while Adam didn't have a, uh, didn't have an arborist uh, collaborator, uh, but this, this is sort of a, a trickle-down collaboration where a lot of the things that we work on or other things begin to show up on, on this, this other project. That's right, and I think the, the nature of a good collaboration is that it doesn't just affect the project that you're working on, it affects every project that comes after it. So I felt like we had Jim over our shoulder there with this one, um, helping us to figure out how to grow the best trees. Um, I'll give another example fairly quickly, or this one's interesting because this is a current project myself and Jim are, uh, are collaborating on. Um, but I wanted to give a chance for you to talk about some of yours, Jim. This is Castle Two and Free Courtyard. This is a building by Architects Alliance, a development by Cressford. And this is a freeway collaboration, really. It's ourselves, Jim, and Dan User Water Architecture. So we came together to do a competition for a building that's actually under construction and designed to bring them a vision of a courtyard. And without going into too much detail, the notion here was 
from macro to micro. This is a mid-block connection within the city. So rather than just a passageway, can this become a place of discovery and imagination? And actually where city dwellers can retreat from the rush of urbanity. And to do that, we wanted to completely surprise people. So when you step into this courtyard, it's a space transformed and unlike anything else you experience. Uh, you can flip the slide, please. Thanks. Very briefly then, um, the inspiration behind this is that this design for the buildings was two almost identical twin towers in the courtyard in the center, symmetrical and shaped, purposeful. So we looked at pure architecture, remember pure garden and the notion of retreat or paradise. So uh, we're looking here at classical forms of completely contrived landscapes, yet which are, um, are a singular idea with a rich tapestry of color and uh, botany. And next slide, please. So here, you're f you, we're just we're up in the air and we're looking back down into the courtyard and uh, you start to see that tree. So the architects took the wise step of actually giving us a meter and a half of overburden of the building, depressed the slab low enough that we could grow trees here. We didn't do that though. We actually used that grade to sink down the courtyard and allow a flat plane of a table in the center. Our table split down the middle. You can see from the diagrams in the bottom, one half of it is wet, it's water. And the other half is a stone plaza which can be flooded with a thin film of water. So at that point the line is blurred and the entire thing becomes water, which you can actually walk through. We're talking millimeters of water, or you can walk around. So it's a perfectly symmetrical and anchored design, which its um, evolution is completely dynamic. We called it an ever-changing waterscape. And if you flip to the next page, we'll talk about the tree, I guess. So um, this is where Jim's going to jump in, but we wanted a tree which it would surprise people that it existed there, and that it would be compatible with water. So for a place which is a retreat and, and a complete surprise, we needed a tree to fit the bill in terms of um, of being that kind of transcendent object and, and something which um, was somewhat experimental. And Jim, I want you to jump in here and a talk Adam, about your role in the competition. Right. And a Adam said, I have this idea to put this bald cypress in the, uh, in the water. I was hard pressed to ever think of someone who'd actually planted a bald cypress in water and really have yet to find somebody who's done that. Um, plenty of people plant bald cypress, and I also, uh, according to the books, uh, bald cypress was a little bit out of its range in Toronto. So we had two hurdles to overcome, um, and then I think the third hurdle that we probably will be looking at is that we have these images of bald cypress, but these are, are trees that are hundreds of years old, um, and they look quite different when they're young. So we've got a, a lot of stuff going um, against us. Uh, we looked at the precedent uh, for doing this um, uh, and looking at probably San Antonio, Texas, where the trees are actually growing in beds beside the water. Uh, Dan Kiley's famous Dallas Fountain Park where the trees are growing in the water, but they're actually in vaults. Um, and a project I did with Raymond Jungles on Lincoln Road where we have the bald cypress appearing to grow in the water, but it's actually um, uh, the soil is not. Uh, part of the water. They're, they're all separate. So they were all not really replicating the swamp idea um, that we were, were trying to get to. Um, so this is, uh, um, I think, we, is this slide up now with the, your working drawings? Uh, yeah, that's right, yeah. So, I mean, this is actually, it, it, it's under construction because the building slab's going in and uh, we're, we're starting the foundation work underneath it so it's moving it's moving fast and what you're looking at here is um, um, the plan which shows the condition where just half of its water 
I mean, you can imagine that when it fills in, the center portion of it becomes the uh, water table. And it shows the first move was, uh, we asked Jim, like, what's the chances of this single tree surviving? Because you notice on the rendering, there's one tree. And I hopefully you won't change your answer now, Jim, but I think it was around about, it surprised me, it was quite high, 80, 85 percent of transplanting a tree in there. But if you were doing some other um, component of the project where someone said you had an 80 to 85 percent chance of success, you actually wouldn't fancy your odds and you might reconsider your options. So I think the nature of having experimentation in the project is that it's a sliding scale of risk and reward. So what you see here is four trees. So to get around the fact that you know when we first put a tree in, we will not be able to put that huge tree in, yet we want some impact in the short term, we actually plant multiple trees, maybe a bit like the idea of the NBBA courtyard, but we put them in in place and we have a contract with um, a grower here in Toronto that they plant four trees with the goal of having one tree and the best the best one wins. So yeah. we, there's yeah. so, so many unknowns in this particular project. Uh, for example, we are right now beginning the process of acclimatizing uh, dry-grown trees to wet-grown environments uh, with a very, very good, good grower. We didn't bid the project. We, we just said, you're the best guy, and, and he's working with us. We're quite happy with that arrangement. Um, and we also have several different size trees so that we know a, a larger tree is going to be more risky than a smaller tree. Um, I suppose if we got four winners, we might be faced with the, the, the point 30 years out to take some of them out, or we may decide that four trees uh, looks fine and, um, and live with that. But it's been yeah. um, all of the, the, the working with the fountain consultant, trying to get the, amount, the right amounts of oxygen, uh, water flow uh, through this. This is this something that cannot be winterized, um, even in Toronto. Um, and we expect it to freeze. Um, uh, huge numbers of questions that, that uh, we're, we're working through in this, in this process that you wouldn't be able to do um, if you just hired a consultant to say, tell us how to do this. If Adam asked me just, will this work or not, without me being involved, I probably would say, no, don't do it. But with the, the chance to really explore uh, all these questions uh, in the collaboration has been um, really uh, amazing uh, for us to be able to do this. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting that. And see, I'm just going to just, you know what, for time's sake, do you want to skip this? Yeah, I'm going to move on to the, the, the next Good idea. slide. So a few of the other projects that, that we've done, to, uh, this is a project I did uh, with Hair Shout and um, a plant architects in Toronto, um, all roof garden except for one small area. Um, some simple ideas, for example, Peter Shout wanted some trees up on the upper deck, but the, the structural engineer told us we could only have about six inches of soil. Um, and as the landscape soil guy, I studied the structure and, and drew a sketch of an H-shaped inverted beam that would be added to the deck with the deck bolted to this new beam. And I said, what would that do to the... The, the structure and how much soil could we put on it and surprisingly he came back and said you could put about uh, three or four feet of soil on it if you did that. So we, we were able to retrofit the deck. Uh, we had some very, very large trees um, uh, that we wanted to save. That roadway that you see going by was is actually uh, cantilevered over the, the, the root zone of those trees and, and they've grown very, very successfully. Um, we wanted to save some trees on the site, um, and we moved trees bare root. Uh, we experimented with the uh, Missouri gravel bed, moving or uh, transplanting trees bare root um, in the site. Uh, um, new exploring ideas of, of, of rainwater harvesting right in the plaza. I'm using the plaza space underneath as a rainwater system with. Um, use of, of silver cells. Um, we also reused some of the existing soil that was on the site. 
the collaborative experience allowed us to explore the edges of all kinds of ideas that, that you would never be able to explore um, um, in that, that idea. Uh, getting back to the Toronto waterfront, I, I think the slide should be up at, at this point. Um, and here we, I, I had a, a tremendous uh, relationship with DTAH um, and also Claude Comier, um, two, two designers working on two different parts of, of the project, um, both coming, trying to come up with, with schemes that, that work together. Uh, with, I believe, DTH serving as the overall master plan. Um, and uh, things like, this is the first time we did silver cells. It was the first time we did silver cells with an internal water distribution system. Uh, so we were actually able to mock up that system, uh, just the water distribution system, and see how it worked. Um, lots of discussion down in the lower right-hand side of this uh, uh, image uh, of exactly how big that that hole should be that the the, the, the tree was planted in. Um, at the Sugar Beach side, um, I think the slide is uh, probably coming up. Um, they wanted this sandy beach. Uh, there were issues with the pH. We we have large soil volumes that we were able to convince them to put in underneath the sand. They wanted some of the trees to be on mounds on the other side, so we put the same soil in. And what we found was that the willow, the willow trees grew incredibly well on the sandy side and not so well on the, the, the mound side. And the pine trees grew very, very well on the mound side and not so well on the beach side. Um, so when Adam was mentioning experiments, um, all of these things are, are a bit of a, of a learning curve. And the last project is this uh, Raven Jungles project, which I alluded to before, uh, where everything underneath the water um, in these, um, for these trees is silva cells holding up the fountain. Uh, this was a totally new idea um, to, to use this kind of application. Um, we had to develop new soil mixes uh, because there's no soil in Miami to use, so we had to uh, essentially really fabricate soil. Um, so it was an incredibly interesting collaboration. Really enjoyed it. So we have about 12 minutes left. So Adam, congratulations. We finished uh, reasonable time. Yeah. And uh, Lita, we are ready to move into questions. Great. Thank you both so much. Yeah, so if you haven't already um, and you want to put in a, a question, please go ahead and do so now. This is the time. Um, and we'll jump in with the ones that have started to come in already. Um, so Adam and Jim, I'm not sure which is the right, which of you is the right person to start this, but um, we have one question that I imagine is on many people's minds, which is about managing client expectations, um, particularly in regard to the Casa Courtyard project. How how did you manage client expectations when telling them that three of the potential four trees may not survive? Um, I, I could maybe talk to that, and but um, it. It needed explanation in terms of why not just not just the expectation of a client, but the, the ultimate users. Because when a condominium takes something over, they they tend to like it. And then if they like this image of you know many trees growing together and growing big, then why would you take any out? So because you give them actually attached to them. We don't actually plant trees to get rid of them. But when we explain to them in terms of this being a system. Then I think they got it. They still also, you know, when the when you know we explained that we needed to buy three, four, five trees even. Um, at least that was not a lot of money because the purchase of a tree is never much compared to the installation of it. But it, it was it was a case of just that helping them understand there was an end goal here, and that maybe it changes a little bit as you go along. But we want the best environment in this courtyard. I, I would add that the, the client is absolutely integral to any design project, uh, in, and, and they are part of the collaboration. So it's not like we did all of this work and then said, ta-da, here's the answer, uh, uh, client. Uh, um, they, I, I, I've always felt that 
my best work has always been been when the client took a very very active role in in the the, the design process itself and attends meetings and and is is buying into the scheme as it's coming uh, together because if you don't have that um, it's it's not going to, it's never going to work I think all of us who are in this business know that uh, without a, a dedicated passionate client you can't do dedicated passionate work. Yeah, and I'd add one minor thing then is that with this client, I'd underscore that, that in some ways when the, when we first talked about this with the city, they, they almost wanted to dumb it down a little, and, and it's the client's belief that this could be actually better. This is a good developer who wants to make great public space. They really stood behind um, the vision. So you're going to go to the next question? Yes. Um, all right. Uh, any comments on effective collaboration with engineers, given that objectives can be further apart um, between designers and engineers than between designers and tree experts? Um, I've had really good uh, collaborative experiences with, with engineers. Um, most of the uh, projects that we work on, the engineer is there early. It's not like we come up with these schemes and turn them over to the engineer. Uh, that rooftop planter um, that I showed you at Toronto City Hall, um, our structural engineer was was really helpful um, in, in all the early the early work. So we're coming up with schemes. If we if we do this or that, you know what happens? And he doesn't have to fully engine quote engineer the calculations, um, but he needs to be able at that point in the process to say this is an insane idea or yeah this could work and uh, getting an engineer who can think uh, think along those conceptual lines is um, y you need to look for the right person but they, they exist out there um, and uh, I think probably more now than, than ever there, there there are plenty of good engineers uh, whether it's the water engineer or the electrical or the structural or the civil um, who get excited about these kinds of things. Adam, what's your experience? I, I would, I, I agree with that, um, and I would draw the distinction between, and maybe the, the question is hinting at this, is between engineers and um, the institution, institutionalized groups of engineering. So when you're dealing with one engineer, it's a creative act, so once you set the parameters in place around what the goal is, then you can get, just as with any collaborator, amazing amazing thinking, which actually reinforces and improves the scheme, and I mean in every form of engineering. I think what it hints at is that sometimes it's harder to change direction with certain preconceptions when you have you know, municipal divisions um, working alongside each other in terms of planning, engineering, transportation. That then is harder, but again, it can be broken through, and that's where that's where the people come into play, agents of change, and and actually leadership. When you're all trying to do the same thing and you believe in it, then uh, you get it done. Here's a question just about uh, collaboration generally, and you touched on this at the beginning of the presentation, but. Um, what are your feelings about conflict during the collaborative process? Is that is that a good thing, an expected thing? Can you speak to that a bit? Um, well, I, yeah. I think conflict is good. Uh, that's the whole reason for the collaboration is you have divergent uh, skills and divergent ideas. Um, and so it's really about the, the conflict management. So you go into this barn um, and there, there may be some points where sometimes where you have to go off into corners and think or um, uh, or and I, and in the collab I've had the privilege of working some really good powerful collaborations um, uh, where you you don't win the day in that meeting but you come back the next time and somebody will say you know I've been thinking about your idea and you know let's let's explore that but yeah no conflict is, is good and you just have to Avoid pushing it to the point where you literally blow up the barn. That's that's the, the management um, of the of, of the process. And and whoever there's always a lead person in every collaboration. Um, they're never equal or symmetrical. Um, and that's really the job of the 
but the lead person is to manage those issues. Anything yeah, you want to add, I, I Adam? Can't. No, because you said it so well, and I agree with everything you said. Um, conflict is actually uh, completely necessary as um, a tool to get better work, and it just has to be positive, and it relies on people not being entrenched. That's all. Otherwise, everything's Great. Yeah. So um, you mentioned... Um, you know, the, the necessity of accepting that some ideas will fail. Um, how have you or project owners approached remedies for some of the tree experiments where there have been noticeable failures? Were there allowances set aside for replacements or changes? Um, well, a, a, a lot of times uh, the, the, these things, especially the very tight ones, it's difficult to replace trees. So it's, I think, first of all, it's important to understand why you're losing the, the, the tree, why, why whatever you proposed would not work. Um, and sometimes there are, um, uh, so, some, sometimes there are easy solutions, but often they're, they're very difficult. For example, the, the center picture here at Lincoln Center, uh, we had a problem with one tree um, out of 30, and it just wasn't wasn't performing, and uh, fortunately, uh, we were able to figure out what the problem was. It turned out it was a, a localized drainage problem, um, and we were able to fix it without uh, tearing up the entire plaza. Uh, but uh, everyone understood that, you know, once we identified the problem, um, the, the fix could be found. Um, usually, you can figure out where the problem is. It may take a little effort, but you can. Yeah, and and I, I would I would agree, and and I think the art of it, as you hinted at, is figuring out where those points of failure are, making sure that any point of failure isn't a complete failure for the project, and building in those systems, uh, you can um, I guess the word was repair, but manage um, some of the unknowns that may come up, or some of the knowns, for instance. I mean, even down to the fundamentals of how big a hole is that you can take the tree out again, so. It's um, it's essentially future proofing. Yeah, and what one thing we uh, I, I have observed is that the more we try to make very very precise geometries with a living object such as a tree, the more likely you're going to get in trouble. Um, you can't you can't expect to do 50 trees and have them all like alike. Just like I mean, I only have two children, and um, I still can't figure out. And they're in their 30s. Um, why they didn't turn out exactly the way I wanted them to. Um, and trees are not a whole lot different. Here's kind of a related question that um, another attendee asked. Um, to what extent do you incorporate maintenance regimes into the specifications for a finished project? Um, I, I, I could try and answer that and, um, and expand it beyond just trees and that it is a modern phenomenon or a contemporary phenomenon that we are realizing how little we build in a logic of maintenance into our projects. And I think multiple industry-wide in terms of design, um, that's dawning on us more and more, especially in terms of the public realm. So we tend to get fascinated with capital projects because of the ribbon cutting and the handshake and here we go. But Putting in solid plans for maintenance is, is becoming the topic of today. So it's a really astute question. In terms of trees, in terms of anything, um, that's probably that's the next frontier of really good public space, both in terms of how you maintain it and keep it, uh, program it, use it. It's, it's a really rich topic. And I can say that I will admit it hasn't always been front of mind to us in, in our career and that somehow you're expected, if you design it perfectly, it won't fail. And that's, that's an unrealistic expectation that we've allowed to proliferate about the work we do. So um, that notion that we should actually build this kind of thing in is, is starting to become more relevant. So for instance, with the CASA one, we're not buying trees, we're buying a relationship with a grower and an implementer and a, a pruner and a manager to steward these trees. Yeah, and, and 
what I've always believed is our first task as designers is to make sure that the project is maintainable. So as I, I make these soil volumes, for example, in sealed environments and uninspectable environments, um, we, we make it harder and harder for the, the poor person who's going to have to do something uh, to do their job. Um, we just had a, a really interesting discussion two weeks ago on CASA that, Adam, you missed because you were on vacation, uh, with a water uh, guy. Um, about different options for aeration systems, and it boiled down to um, how how could the maintenance person know when the system was starting to fail, um, and what were the ramifications of that, um, and that led us down the road to which option made the most sense, um, but the. The, the, the more we try to make things tidy and neat and can't see how it works, uh, we also make it harder to see how it can be maintained. So I think we, we, we should be thinking that our design aesthetic has got to include um, uh, making access points, making maintainability, making ways of checking things um, uh, within, within the systems that we're designing. Completely agree, and, and if you look at any well-designed factory, for instance, there's a certain beauty in the pragmatism, and uh, maybe we can embrace that. It's um, a couple minutes past the hour, and I want to be mindful of your time, um, Jim and Adam, but we do still have a lot of people on the webinar and a lot of questions coming in. If you have a few more minutes, we could try to get to a couple more. What do you think? I'd go for it. Yep. Okay. Adam? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Great. Thank you both. So um, here's a, a question kind of to go back again toward the, the logistics of collaboration. What have you both found to be effective in terms of actualizing your project the way you visualize it um, in regards to Photoshop images versus personal consultation and illustrative sketches? Oh, let me make sure I understand that. Um, Sorry, read it. Read just the last bit again. Yeah. What have you found to be effective in terms of actualizing your project the way you visualize it um, relative oh, to Photoshop yeah. images versus personal consultations and sketches? Right. Um, I guess the first point is that we can't be too set in how we visualize a project in, in terms of its um, the ultimate outcome as to what it's exactly going to look like. Um, so typically when we conceptualize a project, we first try and agree on the ideals or the goals or um, the underlying principles. And then throughout the collaboration, you can start to flesh out what that's going to look like. And, and then we have, a good, just like how we collaborate in on that slide in terms of you know webinars and, and this and that. We have so many tools at our disposal. Um, I would say that one of our primary ones is, is when we get to that stage, we always understand things three-dimensionally, inside and outside. Um, but I think there's a, there's a step before you, you visualize or you decide what something looks like that a collaboration has to be able to inform that. I hope I was answering the question that was asked. I, I think that as as designers, we um, have fought, and I'm I'm all very old school. I'm I'm almost uh, well, I'm 68 years old this year. Uh, never did learn um, how to draw on a computer with renderings, but um, You're lucky. I, I think I think that we we still need to be able to draw, and I think drawing in meetings, and if you're talking about getting something actualized. You've got to sell the client, um, and you're going to sell it in a meeting. Um, a friend of mine, Michael Ferguson, who's an incredibly good landscape architect, um, just can sit and draw in meetings like uh, I'm just envious of the way he, he's able to control a meeting by drawing. Um, so I, I would encourage designers who are in collaborations to be drawing during the collaboration, drawing with the client, and don't be afraid to draw during meetings presentations, uh, take take a pen and draw on your own drawings. 
uh, draw on your consultant's drawings. Um, we, we are just if, at reach this point where if it's not in a computer, it's not real. Um, we should be able to draw a tree that looks like a tree. Um, it should look like a plane tree if it's a plane tree or an oak tree if it's an oak tree in the meeting. Uh, we should have those skills. Maybe I'm a little too um, Pollyanna about that, but I, I know the old designers could do that. I've seen it done, and we, we shouldn't consider that to be a lost skill. Great. Um, in your experience, um, both of you, has there been a bigger push toward mixing species on a project instead of just planting one species? And how do you think that increased um, tree diversity could be prioritized? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. I, I think that diversity, when we're thinking of diversity, we have to think about it at a citywide scale. Um, even this project that's up on the right-hand side of, of uh, the screen right now, the, the water's edge, um, that particular uh, promenade I think has about 350 trees. They're all uh, Freeman maples. Um, is that a monoculture? Um, by some definitions, yes. I don't mind doing something like that um, as long as I don't plant a whole lot of Freeman maples anywhere else. Um, so I think there are advantages and disadvantages uh, to that. Um, there are other things that we get from diversity, um, so I think we can in include other species, uh, but we better be very sure we understand uh, what the goals are um, and are we really achieving them. Just putting in a different species to be diverse is, is not necessarily um, uh, making us very smart designers. There's a whole yeah. section in my book on, on diversity, which I wrote in 2008. I uh, still stand by um, what I wrote then. And, and I would add very briefly that I, I think the question was predicated on the fact that sometimes that's been used as an excuse for no diversity, but you know, the diversity happens on a metropolitan level. And, and I would agree with what you said, Jim, um, but it can't be an excuse for many monocultures within the city. So, you know, some projects by nature of um, the design, and we're looking at one of them, required uh, a single kind of tree, but only if we embrace diversity, really embrace it in another aspect of the project, or we'll always look for opportunities. For instance, I know when Westside DTH did Queen's Key, diversity was incorporated on the north side, whereas on the south side there are plane trees, but if then the parks of them in central waterfront become places for diversity, and diversity is taken as a real design opportunity, then, it, then it's a rich topic. Yeah, and on Queen's Key, we, we had a situation where we had really good soil resource opportunities on the south side and very, very poor soil resources on the north side. So the diversity was as much about saying, uh, if I plant the same tree on both sides of the street, it's going to look terrible, um, where if I plant diverse species, you'll be less noticeable that the ones on the north side were not growing as well as uh, on the south side because there's nothing to compare them to. Great. All, all the examples that you guys shared today, I think, um, were from uh, the eastern half of, of the U.S. or Canada, um, but many of us in the west are facing really serious drought conditions. Um, are there any projects that you know of or new ideas related to planting trees uh, in that new climate reality? Um, the first thing I would do is encourage you to look at the webinar we did on uh, planting in desert soils. And that while you might be, if you're in the Los Angeles space and not in a, a, a desert environment, for example, um, all those principles apply. Um, I, I think that Essentially, the more soil you, as you get drier, you need more and more soil. All of those soil volume requirements are based on water. Uh, Nina's work uh, in the, the early 1980s um, was, was all based on water demand. Um, and as you get into drier and drier climates, those soil volume requirements go up. Uh, one of the things that I like about soils under pavement is that you completely 
uh, eliminate the uh, evaporation out of the soil um, uh, because the pavement is essentially 100% mulch. Uh, not, nothing evaporates through it. Um, and so you're going to retain more water and it also allows you, if you do it right, to get more water um, into that soil. Um, also, we must get rid of this idea of these sand manufactured soils. Um, uh, they, we really need to get back to doing uh, good old loam soils, as heavy a soil as we can, can do, that the, 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 with greater and greater water holding capacity. Um, uh, so we hold the water for, for a much longer, longer time. And then finally, of course, species would be very important. And we may be having to shift um, looking for um, a much more drought tolerant uh, species. But the principles on collaboration are exactly the same. It's maybe even more important because you've got to draw from a, a, a greater and greater um, uh, field of knowledge. Uh, to solve a more difficult problem. Great. Well, let's let's have one more question and then we'll wrap up. Given um, the various stakeholders in any given project, how do you both um, how do you both set the the time frame? Like, what time frame are you typically designing for um, when when designing for trees and selecting species? Uh, you want to take a first crack at that, Adam? Sure. Um, I want to make sure I understand it. what time frames we set for incorporating that dialogue. Is that the implication? You know, I'm I'm actually not totally sure. I read it as as written, um, but okay. but yeah. interpret it interpret it as as you wish. I think either way would be interesting. Okay, um, I think that um, I mean any collaboration is an ongoing process. The richest part of it is obviously the beginning, but that doesn't preclude, uh, especially in the topic of, of trees, getting everyone engaged in it. I mean, we showed you an example of a, a collaboration which was more than just a general landscape architect and of course a client and a tree expert, but also a water expert, structural engineering, conservative civil engineering. So there are a ton of people that can be brought into that fold and affect the outcome. So, Obviously, there's an advantage to doing that in an early and open way, um, but I, you know, it's from experience. There's it's never too late for a good idea. Um, beyond the realities of when a project has to be has to be implemented, but then you know, there's always the next project. So it's an ongoing thing, and the relationships we build now will, will build good projects now, and maybe even better ones later. And then I'll hand it over to Jim. Um, it, I would answer that from the perspective of how, how long do I expect the tree to live? Um, and, and I think we have a, a, a woefully short uh, uh, view right now. Um, I think we, we think that if it, if it lives to the end of, of the next budget cycle, sometimes it's, uh, it, it, it's done its job. Um, in uh, Britain, uh, they have about um, three or four hundred trees that are a thousand years old. And they have thousands of trees that are at least 500 years old. Um, in the United States, we have practically none right, except out of the great western forest. Uh, but in the eastern United States, um, a three or four hundred year old tree is considered to be an ancient tree. Um, and the reason uh, for that is partly our attitude toward toward trees and the differences between us and the Brits and how we prune them. Um, but soil, um, other, other things, and our throwaway society um, makes it difficult to, um, uh, to, to, to get to the 100 or 200 year old tree in a city. Uh, but I, I believe that we should be thinking uh, that we can grow at least a 100 year old tree uh, with reliability. Uh, we should be able to do that as a, as a profession. Um, Olmsted certainly did it. Um, we were there and we've lost that uh, realm. Um, certainly it's hard to crank in things like Dutch elm disease or emerald ash borer attacking, uh, attacking the trees. 
but we should be able to provide the growing environment that short a, a major disaster, uh, insect disease, um, uh, traumatic uh, uh, earthquake or something, uh, that these trees should have the potential to live at least 100 years. And, and when I solve that one, then I'll shoot for 200. <laughs> Well, on that note, um, I think we should wrap up the webinar. Um, thank you so much to everyone who joined us today. I'm really sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions. There were just far too many um, for us to address in this time frame. But please feel free to reach out to any of us using the contact information that's on the screen right now. Um, a link to the recording of the webinar will be sent out in a follow-up email, um, as well as a link to today's slide deck. And it will also be on our YouTube channel for anyone who wants to watch there. Adam and Jim, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. Oh, thank you, Adam, and thank you, Lita. Thank you both, Jim. Always a pleasure. Take care, guys.